All right, well, this evening we're returning to Matthew chapter 5, uh, Jesus' exposition of the law of God, not actually changing its meaning, but rather explaining what God originally intended as over against what the teachers of Israel uh, were, were teaching. They made it essentially easy to keep. Jesus tells us that what it intends is actually much deeper, but that by the Holy Spirit, he gives us the power uh, to do these things. Now, as I've said, this paragraph and the next paragraph are actually going to be some of the most challenging things the Lord calls us to do. So contrary to uh, really the old man, the old nature, uh, but something that the new nature gives us the ability to do. So let's read uh, Matthew 5, verses 38 through 42. Jesus says, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. Whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks of you. And do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. May the Lord bless his word to our understanding, and may he also give us the grace to do what he calls us to do here. Now, again, just by way of review this morning, we saw again how the new nature uh, helps us, gives us really the ability to keep the third commandment, how instead of making empty vows and oaths, uh, we will actually keep those things that, that we commit ourselves to do. We will not try to avoid those things, but we will do them. We will be men and women of our word. And remember, we, we were reminded that, that swearing, again, the kind of swearing the Bible speaks of, the taking of oaths and the making of vows is really a part of the worship that God calls us to, a part of the worship that we owe, and we owe to God alone. Even though it seemed like Jesus was saying that we're not supposed to swear at all, we saw examples in Scripture of those who actually did. Remember, Paul made a vow, uh, likely a Nazarite vow, in which he dedicated himself uh, to seek and to serve the Lord even more earnestly than he had been for a specific period of time. We believe that that was the vow he was under because at the end of the vow, he had his hair cut, which was a part of this uh, particular procedure. We also saw how Jesus responded to the high priest's imposition of an oath, requiring him to testify whether or not he was, in fact, the Messiah. So the point we saw was essentially this, that we are to swear, we are to take oaths and make vows, but we are only to do it in God's name or by his name, as Moses writes in Deuteronomy 6.13, you shall fear only the Lord your God and you shall worship him and swear by his name. Um, remember, remembering that to swear by any other is to give the worship that belongs to God uh, to another, which really amounts to idolatry. Uh, Jesus was not telling us uh, that we shouldn't swear oaths and make vows, but he was really addressing uh, the problem that the Jewish leaders had caused by their own practice and teaching of swearing by things other than God, swearing by heaven or by earth or by Jerusalem or by their head, which means by their life, in order to avoid the binding force of the oath or the vow. They believed that they could appear that they were making these oaths and vows, but in fact, they thought they weren't. Jesus tells us that when we swear, we are bound by what we say. And so we should not only be careful to say what we mean, we should also do what we say. Certainly, that's what Jesus did. And he gives us his spirit to help us to do the same thing. Now, this evening, Jesus goes on now to deal with another, uh, surprisingly, a Jewish misinterpretation of God's law. And that's what's called the law of retaliation. To show us what we are to do when our personal rights have been violated. Jesus says we are to show mercy. We are not to seek vengeance. And the purpose behind it is that we might be a witness of his grace. 
Now, Jesus begins by quoting the, the law in question in verse 38 of Matthew 5. He says this, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And I would again ask you to note how he introduces it, showing us that he's about to challenge another Jewish interpretation. Now, what he's dealing with here is not really one of the commandments, like not one of the Ten Commandments, but, but it is a part of the law. It's a principle of justice. And in this case, what the penalty would be for the breaking of the Sixth Commandment, because that's actually what these things have to do with. Remember, the Sixth Commandment tells us not only that we are not to murder, which means to uh, unjustly to take away the life of someone else, but that we are not to do anything that would harm our neighbor. Okay, that's what we're supposed to do. We're not supposed to harm them. But the question is, what if we do? What is the penalty if, if we should injure them in some way? Well, uh, that's what this law is actually all about. Now, Moses tells us uh, in Exodus 21, verses 22 through 25, this is where the, this law is actually used. And it's interesting the context in which it's being used. I think this is a very powerful text that tells us what God thinks of abortion, of anything that would harm an unborn child. This is what he says. If men struggle with each other and strike a woman with child so that she has a miscarriage, yet there is no further injury, he shall surely be fined as the woman's husband may demand of him, and he shall pay as the judges decide. But if there is any further injury, then you shall appoint as a penalty life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for bruise. Now again, let me draw your attention, first of all, to the fact that, that this is addressing not just the, the woman and her well-being, but also the life of the unborn. The Lord views the unborn child as a human being with all the same rights. Now, if the woman miscarries her child, but the child is okay and there's no further harm, no further injury, then the one who caused it is fined according to what the father or the husband desires or according to the judges. But if there is further injury, doesn't specify the mother or the child, I think because it applies to both. If there is further injury either to the mother or to the child, then the penalty is, notice, life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, etc. Now, there were certain circumstances under which the penalty of this law didn't necessarily have to be carried out in that way. There may be a fine that was um, made instead or, or required instead to compensate for the injury, at least if it didn't have to do with the taking away of one's life. If you put out your neighbor's eye, you might be able to make restitution in return that doesn't require that your eye be put out. But I do want you to notice here the principle of justice, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, and so forth. This for that, the punishment must meet the crime. Whatever it is your neighbor is suffering, then you suffer the same thing. Now this is the law of retaliation. It's a principle of justice. It tells us that the punishment should fit the crime. Now, it was meant to, uh, to do two things. It was meant to limit retaliation or redress, not to take away your neighbor's life for an eye or to take away your neighbor's life for a tooth, but to make sure there was, uh, there was justice here, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but also to make sure that the penalty was really met the crime. If one takes a life then their life is forfeit. Now, I do want you to notice here that Jesus is not questioning the principle itself, is he? he he's not, that's not what he's dealing with in this text. He's not saying that the principle is invalid because this is 
justice. This is the justice that God enacted in Israel. This is really what we see as being, you know, equal, equality. Well, that's, that's not the problem. It's not the principle. The problem was that the Jews were actually applying this principle that was meant for the courts to their personal relationships and using it as, as personal, as basically a principle of personal retaliation or revenge. You put out my eye, I'll put out your eyes. You knock out my tooth, I'll knock out your tooth. You bruise me, I'll bruise you back. Now, what does Jesus say that we should do in cases like this when it comes to personal relationships? Is this the way we are to behave? No, he tells us, don't retaliate, but rather show mercy. Go the extra mile. Don't seek vengeance. Vengeance belongs to the Lord. Instead, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. Um, do good in, you know, in, uh, in return for their, for their evil. Now, Jesus gives us several illustrations of how we are to apply this principle. He actually gives to us four of them. The first one is in verse 39. But I say to you, do not resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. Now, I think you understand that all these illustrations require a little bit of explanation because uh, what exactly is Jesus saying here? Stand there and be a punching bag for anybody who might want to beat you to death? Well, no, that's not what he's saying. What he's saying is this. In the Jewish culture, to be hit on the right cheek, which was normally done with, with the back of the hand, was the worst insult that one could give another in that culture. And we have to admit, I don't think we would take, you know, think too highly of it today either. Now, Jesus is not here speaking about a situation where somebody is coming after you to, uh, to beat you to a pulp or perhaps to murder you. In these kinds of circumstances, we do have the right to defend ourselves. We have the right to defend our neighbor. We I think it wasn't too long ago we were looking at the commandments. We actually saw that we have the right to use lethal force to stop somebody from unjustly taking our lives or the lives of our neighbor. That's not what it's saying, that you shouldn't pack a gun or if somebody starts shooting, let them shoot away. But he's talking here about personal insults. What are we supposed to do when somebody insults us? Well, Jesus says we are not to resist them. We're not to withstand or oppose, stand our ground, refuse to yield to them. But he says, turn the other cheek, which essentially means be willing to stand and allow them to continue the insults, to continue to demean us if that is what they want to do. Now, the question is, why does Jesus tell us to do this? Well, Again, think about Jesus himself and how he responded in situations like this. It's because of the witness that it actually brings to the offender, particularly in our culture, but the same thing was true in their culture. They wouldn't expect us to respond that way. They would expect us to do what they are doing. They would expect us to retaliate, perhaps to egg us on into some kind of a fist fight or some kind of a, of a battle. They wouldn't expect a meek and a gentle spirit that takes the abuse. As a matter of fact, it would be very surprising to run into somebody who wasn't willing to retaliate. But you know what? Jesus didn't retaliate, and it often surprised his adversaries. I mean, how many times did Jesus actually do what he's calling us to do here? How many times did he endure personal insults and not retaliate? Uh, there was one occasion where they actually accused him of being in league with the devil. Remember the situation with, of the unpardonable sin. But Jesus actually never retaliated for the personal offense towards him. Instead, he stood up and defended the Holy Spirit and talked about what a terrible sin it was that they were committing against him. When he was put on trial by his enemies and there were many false witnesses that came laying false charges at his feet, Jesus did not defend himself. We read in Matthew 26, verses 62 through 63, the high priest stood up and said to him, do you not answer? 
What is it that these men are testifying against you? But Jesus kept silent. He didn't retaliate. And he did this to fulfill Isaiah 53, verse 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shearers, so he did not open his mouth. He did this to fulfill the prophet's he did this, of course, to lay down his life for us, but he also did it to be an example to us of how we are to suffer insults and not retaliate for the sake of the gospel. I mean, just think about what kind of a witness it would be if you're, you're let's say, witnessing for Christ. Somebody gets angry at you and uh, begins to curse at you or begins to curse the Lord, and then you haul off and and punch him. I mean, what kind of a witness is that going to bring? But if you stand there and endure it silently and still try to do good to that individual, you see, that brings quite a different witness of a different kind of character and nature that they really are not used to. And it will make them think. Now, this, as I've said, will bring a witness where retaliation will not. We are to show mercy rather than taking vengeance. Now, let me just say, this is one of the hard sayings of Jesus. <laughs> it's, not, it's not hard to understand what he's saying, but it is hard to do this. It grates against our old nature. Our first inclination at insults is to retaliate. Remember, not simply to get mad, but to get even. But let's remember that even though in our flesh we don't have the strength to do this, the Spirit gives us the ability to do this. It's part of the new nature that he has given us in the Lord Jesus Christ as he continues to make us more like him. So be willing to stand and take the insults for the sake of the gospel. Now, Jesus' second illustration has to do with those who take us to court. He says in verse 40, if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, which is basically the undergarment, let him have your coat also, essentially the outer garment. Now, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians, actually, uh, in the case of a brother, that if a brother should take another brother to court, it would be better, especially in the face of unbelievers, to suffer loss rather than to fight your brother in front of others, uh, and especially to even turn around and retaliate and try to to take something from them they're trying to take from you. This is what he says in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 5 through 8. I say this to your shame. Is it so that there is not among you one wise man who will be able to decide between his brethren? But brother goes to law with brother, and that before unbelievers. Actually, then, it is already a defeat for you that you have lawsuits with one another. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be defrauded? On the contrary, you yourselves wrong and defraud. You do this even to your brethren. Now, what Paul is saying here, obviously, is it would be better to suffer the loss than to drag the name of Christ in front of everybody to see two brothers fighting with one another. Now, Jesus tells us that likewise, sometimes it's better to do the same with unbelievers. I don't think he necessarily... Um, qualifies this as being a believer, although we do understand it's in the context of the Old Covenant Church, so perhaps it's more along the lines of what Paul is saying. But he is saying that sometimes it's better to let go of what it is that person is after for the sake of peace rather than to retaliate, to show mercy and not vengeance. Now, think about this for a minute, though. Jesus is not telling us that it's always wrong to pursue our legal rights. There was an instance where Paul was beaten illegally in Philippi, and when they wanted to release him after they found out he was a Roman citizen and he had been illegally beaten, they wanted to sort of, you know, get him out of there secretly. But Paul insisted that the city officials come out and apologize for what it is they had done to him and to Silas before they left the cell. We know that when Paul was arrested in Jerusalem and uh, basically he was speaking before the Jews while he was under the custody of the Romans, 
that the Jews wanted to take him and execute him. And so he exercised his legal right as a Roman citizen and he appealed to Caesar so that they could not kill him. There are times when we should insist on our legal rights, but there are also times when we may give them up if by so doing we might bring a witness for Jesus. Now, one of the things I think is really interesting about Paul's situation that I didn't really think about until I was looking at this subject is this, that Paul didn't even mention the fact that he was a Roman citizen when he was being beaten. He waited until he had been beaten and when he was, and he had spent essentially a night in, in prison in the stocks um, overnight, uh, he allowed himself to be arrested and mistreated. He could have avoided all of that. So why did he do it? Well, he did it so that he might testify of God's grace. To those who were in the prison, what better way to testify of God's grace than to actually go into the prison, as well as to the Philippian jailer. Now, perhaps the Lord showed him that that's what he wanted him to do. We don't know if he was purposely, you know, getting himself, uh, you know, not, not defending himself, so he might be arrested under every circumstance. But look at the results. The jailer was saved. His whole family was saved because Paul did not, uh, you know, stand up for his rights and refuse to, to submit to what it is they wanted to do. He purposely let himself be beaten and put in the stocks for this very purpose. We also know that the Lord Jesus Christ did not insist on his rights, but he gave them all up. He was mistreated, he was condemned, he was scourged, he was crucified, and he never actually even offered a defense. And he did this for the sake of the gospel. He did this for the sake of his enemies, for their good. And remember when he was on the cross, he prayed for those that crucified him he did this so that he might make at least some of them and he might make us his friends. Jesus did not stand up for his rights in order that he might actually save us. Sometimes we need to give up our rights in order to bring a witness to the gospel. Now Jesus' third illustration has to do with our obligation to show love even to our enemies, which is what the next paragraph is actually about. He says in Matthew 5, verse 41, and again, it has to do with, with rights. He says, whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him two. Now, you know the Jews were under Roman rule, and according to their law, a Roman soldier could conscript any Jew at any time to carry their gear 1,000 paces. We see an example of this in the Bible when they conscripted, remember, Simon of Cyrene to carry Jesus' cross. They just grabbed a man at random and had him do that because they had the right to do that. So any soldier could essentially make a, a Jew his slave at any time, at least for that mile, to, to be, as it were, a, a, a pack mule to carry his belongings. And you can, you, you can believe the Jews greatly resented this. And I'm sure we would too if we were living in that time frame. But Jesus says, instead of being resentful, he tells them to show love and to show mercy. He says, when the mile is complete, turn to the soldier and ask him if he would like another mile. Now, how do you think that would affect the soldier? He knows he's you know, telling this person to do something they don't want to do. And then at the end of that time, when he's expecting to receive the gear back, the person says, can I carry it another mile for you? What would our enemies think if we not only humbled ourselves to serve them, but went the extra mile uh, to do so? It might just open them up to the gospel. Again, this is one of the things I think Jesus has in mind when he tells us that we are to love our enemies. And Ferguson, in his study of the Sermon on the Mount, pointed to this as perhaps one of the things that Paul did that more than anything else actually made his ministry quite fruitful, is that he was always willing at any time to set his rights aside in order to serve, even his enemies. We just saw a great example of that. He was willing to be beaten publicly and put into the, into the prison, into the stocks, in order to bring a witness of the Lord Jesus Christ, in order that he might lead others to Jesus. Jesus. 
We are to show mercy. We are not to seek vengeance. And then Jesus' fourth and final illustration has to do with generosity. Matthew 5, verse 42. He says, Give to him who asks of you, and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. And again, this can open a door for the gospel. Now, this is perhaps the passage that maybe makes us fearful more than any other is because it almost sounds like what Jesus is saying here is if somebody comes up to you and asks you for anything, that you need to give it to them. And I, I do think that we, we have to bring all of Scripture into here and not just look at this in abstraction. I don't think Jesus is telling us here, throw all caution to the wind, violate any other principle in Scripture, and just simply give to whoever asks. Because we do have specific command in Scripture that if somebody does not work, that he shouldn't eat either. Isn't that true? Because he doesn't want us to become an enabler uh, to help others sin by living unproductive lives. And there are certainly many people around we know that are like that who essentially don't want to work. Now, not everybody's on the street because they don't want to work. Some maybe want to work. And, you know, in God's providence, they have ended up on the street. But there's a good number of them who really don't want to work for their money. Uh, they would rather you give it to them or I give it to them to enable them to essentially sin in this way. I don't think Jesus is telling us give money under every circumstance. But he is telling us this, that we do need to give to those who are in need, to those who are really in need, and that we need to give generously. That it would be better to give too much to the one who needs it than, than not to give anything at all. The Lord has given us what he has given to us to take care of our needs, and he's given us more than we need so that we can use it for other purposes. And remember, all of us are called to be stewards of what the Lord has actually given to us. Nothing that we actually have really belongs to us. It belongs to him. And he tells us in his word how we are to use it. And what he tells us here is that we are to use some of it to meet the needs of others. Now, this is what the spirit that Jesus gives us works in our hearts, mercy. Now, I wouldn't say that this is necessarily vengeance, but certainly it is mercy to help somebody who is in need. Jesus will give us everything we need to do the things he's actually called us to do in this passage. He will give us the strength to bear personal offenses patiently and not retaliate. When somebody sues us, he will allow us to let go of what it is they're after for the sake of peace if the situation deserves it. We will serve our enemies without becoming resentful and even go the extra mile. That's what the Spirit of God is moving us to do. And we will be generous to those who are in need. We will do these things because we love the Lord Jesus, because this is what he did. And because he gives us a love and concern for others. We will do it so that we might be a witness to them in the hopes that the Lord, in his mercy, might actually call them to himself. Now, it's not always going to be easy to do these things. Uh, sometimes it's going to be very, very difficult. As I've said, it grates against the flesh. But it will be our desire because honoring Jesus and being a witness to him will be more important to us than anything that we might gain by not doing what he calls us to do, by getting even, by countersuing, by fighting our enemies instead of picking up the gear, instead of attacking him, or by neglecting those in need. Whatever we think we might gain from those things, we won't we'll see it basically as not gaining anything. Our desire will be to gain what it is we have to gain by actually serving the Lord. Because when we do what the Lord calls us to do, we are actually far more blessed. We're not going to be blessed the other direction at all, but we will be far more blessed if we do what the Lord calls us to do. And if we should suffer in his name in doing these things, we will count it a blessing because Jesus basically suffered all these things for us. When we do these things, we are standing in his place.
When we are abused, we are taking the abuse that is essentially meant for him. This is what the Spirit of God works within us. He makes it possible. He actually uh, makes it so that's what we must do. So we need to be thankful that the Lord is doing this work in us. He doesn't leave, us, leave it entirely up to us to do. We do have our part. We do have to yield to the Spirit of God. So let's pray that God would give us the grace to do that and to be strong, as, as we noted at the very beginning. The stronger our love for the Lord, the less of a burden these things are actually going to be uh, to us. Well, let's bow in a moment of prayer, shall we? And, and let's ask the Lord to, um, to help us. Uh, grow in our love to the point where we can do this easily.